Well, good afternoon. Peter Klapman is formerly the Senior Vice President and Chief Investment Officer for TIAA CREF. Chairman of the Governance Committee and a member of the Audit Committee of IPAS today, he serves on the board of the National Association of Corporate Directors. He is also Vice Chairman of the Conference of Mutual Fund Leaders and also a current member of the PCAOB's Standing Advisory Group. Marty Garrett is Vice President of Finance at Verizon Communications. Previously, he was Chief Financial Officer and Chief Accounting Officer of Dusan Infracore International, a manufacturer of the, the manufacturer of Bobcat construction equipment. He is currently a member of the Dusan Board of Directors and Audit Committee, and he began his career with Ernst & Young as a member of the audit practice. Joan Amble is the President of JCA Consulting, a public company board member. NACD Council of Audit Committee Chairs at NACD and retired Executive Vice President and Principal Accounting Officer at American Express. Previously, she was with General Electric as Chief Operating Officer and Chief Financial Officer for GE Capital Markets. She's a Director of Booz Allen Hamilton Holding Corporation, Brown Foreman Corporation, and Sirius XM Radio, Inc. She is also the co-founder and chairman of Women in America, an organization that focuses on the development of women professionals, not chairman but chair of women. Jim Liddy is the U.S. Vice Chair of Audit KPMG, where he is responsible for creating and executing the strategic vision for the U.S. audit practice. In addition, he serves as the Regional Head of Audit, Americas and Chair of the Americas Audit Steering Committee for the firm. Prior to his current role, he served as National Manager of Audit for KPMG and the national business leader of KPMG's financial services practice, a panel that brings to bear omnicompetent experience and insight on the issues of auditor tenure and other basic elements of the audit report. Thank you all. Peter, you want to begin? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, and I hope uh, I'm selected to be the keynoter of this uh, esteemed panel on, on the premise that I can get things livened up uh, after lunch, uh, and, I, and I, hope to, I hope my remarks are taken in that spirit. <clears throat> I'm very pleased that the PCOB has convened this, this, this roundtable to examine very important issues that address the disclosures given to investors about the audit process. In my opinion, the disclosure system presently is flawed in material respects and improvements are necessary. The PCAOB has advanced certain proposals that, while modest in tone and scope, would be beneficial and should be implemented. Um, just to complete the record, in addition to my written remarks, um, I note that I, was, um, I participated in a roundtable probably about a year and a half ago on the issue of a proposal at that time on whether uh, mandatory auditor firm rotation was in the public interest. And my position at that time was that um, auditor rotation is a sound premise, should be implemented at least to the point where companies and audit committees after a period of years should put out the audit assignment for rebidding, for further discussion, um, even allowing for the possibility that the company, the audit committee, would decide that the present auditor is the right choice, but at least make that consideration. And my concern at that time, which is still a concern today, is that too many audit committees um, simply make this a routine matter and do not, as they should, seriously consider the selection and tenure of their outside auditor. And to me, this goes to the issue of independence. Um, I also applaud the PCOB for inviting to this roundtable as many participants from other countries, in particular uh, the UK. In terms of my own experience, as you noted, I was the chief investment lawyer for TI CREF and head of its corporate governance program. I also chaired the International Corporate Governance Network for four years between 2000 and 2004. And at that time, it was clear, and I think would generally be acknowledged by people in this field, that the governance structures and investor protections in the United States were superior 
to basic protections and governance practices abroad. And I fear that this is no longer the case. And I think your participants from the UK hopefully made this clear that they have advanced certain issues, in fact, those including the audit process, which provide for greater investment protection, in my view, uh, than currently exists in the United States. And in particular, advancing the notion of whether um, auditor rotation is appropriate, auditor rebidding is appropriate, I'm, I'm talking about after a fair number of years, not, not to just be done uh, sporadically, but done consistently and with a view towards enhancing independence. And I think including in this last panel this morning, it was noted that, for example, if you do implement uh, one of your proposals, which I strongly uh, am in favor of, which is to um, have the audit report include the tenure, the number of years that the particular audit firm has audited a particular company, that that has generated in the UK, and I think it would in the United States as well, generate more interest on the part of audit committee members um, and also create the impetus for investors to care more about this than they currently do. And part of the problem, I, I think, for investors is that <clears throat> it is extremely hard uh, or, or almost impractical for an investor to know for how long a particular audit firm has audited a particular company. And I think the record is clear, and it was clear a couple of years ago as well, that some audit firms have been uh, the outside auditor for particular companies as long as decades. And, and I heard in one case that it would almost got to be close to 100 years. So that sort of disclosure, which I think would help generate greater interest on the part of both investors and audit committee members, I think would be strongly beneficial and in the public interest and something that investors want. I also particularly note that your two new proposals, uh, first to include the tenure of the current audit firm, and then secondly to include the named uh, lead engagement partner, involve no costs. Uh, one of the issues always at stake on potential reforms or uh, initiatives uh, on the regulatory side is whether particular benefits to some parties will be overwhelmed or in some cases offset too significantly by cost to other investors. And obviously regulators have got to take that concern into consideration. Again, my point about these two proposals is they involve no costs, so therefore no investor is unduly burdened with costs affecting um, disclosures which would be extremely helpful and important to other investors that truly believe independence is a key issue and that the current system ought to be enhanced in the favor of um, of, of, of broader disclosures to protect uh, investors on these audit concerns because currently it is very difficult with the disclosure system in place for investors to even find out how audit firms have been selected, how they are regarded in terms of continued tenure and the like, and I think these reforms would be extremely beneficial. One final note, because uh, I see the red light, is that um, in my former position at TI Cref, we voluntarily did both. We both did rebidding at certain intervals, and at a certain point we did rotate audit firms. Our experience was that the costs were nominal, if any additional um, costs, and our audit process and the audit quality was enhanced. And we believe that if the PCOB adopted uh, First, these particular proposals and consider the broader questions, it would be both cost-worthy and protective investors in a way that's very much needed, and I support these proposals. Thank you, Peter. Monty Garrett. Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to come here today to represent Verizon on this panel. We obviously have a keen interest in matters related to auditor reporting. We also spend a great deal of time an effort communicating with existing and potential investors and finding ways to get them the information they need to make informed investment decisions. 
To that end, we appreciate the efforts of the PCAOB to address investor needs, and we want to continue to work with the board and the staff to accomplish this joint goal. I was invited here today to provide Verizon's input on the proposal to add auditor tenure to the standard auditor's report. Our view on that specific concept is best understood in conjunction with our views on docket number 34 as a whole. As such, I'll discuss our view on tenure and then expand a bit on the overall proposal. Like many other public companies, Verizon discloses information about its audit firm, including tenure, in our annual proxy filing where we ask shareholders to ratify the appointment of the auditors. For the benefit of our shareholders, we also provide background on how the audit committee considers auditor tenure in connection with its evaluation of the auditor's independence and more broadly auditor appointment. In other words, we see audit firm tenure as one component of a robust governance process discussion in our proxy related to the evaluation of the auditor. Accordingly, we think that reporting of auditor tenure is most meaningful when presented within the governance context. It's not completely clear to me what conclusion can be drawn from auditor tenure information, but if an investor finds it useful, there does not seem to be harm in providing the information in an appropriate context. As mentioned in Appendix 5 of the proposal, the available research findings on correlation between auditor tenure and audit quality vary widely. Some researchers suggest that an auditor with a long tenure may have a higher likelihood of independence being impaired, while other researchers suggest an auditor with a short tenure may not have sufficient depth of understanding of a company to render a reliable opinion. I believe the board concluded that there was no analytical information to provide any really meaningful correlation. In all sincerity, I do hope to get insight today on how the tenure information is valuable as we are always interested in transparency and in better understanding how to anticipate our investors' needs. To emphasize this point, we come to work every day knowing there are two groups of people that we cannot live without, our customers and our investors. We're fully committed to listening to our investors and caring for their needs, and that includes addressing concerns that have led to this proposal. To that end, we have chosen to disclose our auditor's tenure information in our proxy statement, and we believe that's the proper home for such disclosure rather than the auditor's report. Our view is on this is a subset of our overall view that an auditor's critical role is to provide assurance that the GAAP financial statements provided by the issuer are materially accurate. Some aspects of the proposal include discussion of critical audit matters and commentary on other information may require the auditor to go beyond its very critical core responsibility of providing insurance, assurance. As stated in our comment letter, we're concerned with having auditors provide this commentary as we feel that the first line of disclosure about the company should be provided by the issuer. If the auditor deems the material misleading or inadequate and the issuer does not rectify, then the auditor has the means to opine accordingly. The current pass-fail opinion is clear and concise and leaves no doubt as to the auditor's view. Freeform language may not be as clear and may leave readers unsure of the audit result. Alternatives were discussed yesterday that we think give investors the additional information on risk they are seeking while preserving the roles of issuer and auditor. Specifically, the, alternati the alternative of having the issuer expand the disclosure in footnote one to cover can items in a more thorough fashion, along with an auditor-specific review of that disclosure, would seem to address many of our concerns. Views on that matter were discussed at length in earlier panels. My only point is to extend our view on the issuer's and auditor's roles to the tenure information. Let the issuer provide the information to investors in the appropriate form and context. Investors will receive the information they desire and the risk of misinterpreting auditor tenure without proper context will be avoided. We have no issues with the other basic elements of the auditor's report included in the proposal. We're not sure if the additional wording on independence adds value as the existing reporting format already includes reference to the auditor being independent, but we certainly see no harm in including it. Again, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this very important process. Thank you. Jill Nam. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to participate today and for, taking, for all of you taking the time to seek constituents' views on these very important topics. The comments I offer are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the organizations of which I am affiliated. 
My background includes positions as an accounting instructor, an auditor, a standard setter, and for most of my career, a senior financial officer of a major corporation. I presently serve on the boards of three public companies, and I believe you would have invited me to participate because of that role. Therefore, while my comments are informed by all of my experiences, they apply most specifically to those as audit committee chair and member. However, my perspective, similar to most, I assume, is to seek sound financial reporting with an unequivocal commitment to integrity, strong governance, and transparency as it relates to all parties involved. Company management, directors, and auditors each have a role to play. Although asked to comment on auditor tenure and other basic elements of the auditor's report, given the significance of the important topic of the disclosure of critical audit matters, I feel compelled to note that I disagree with the direction the board has taken on this proposal and do not support it as currently written. Along with the vast majority of audit committee members with whom I've had the opportunity to discuss this matter, I believe including critical audit matters in auditor's reports would lead only to much longer, but not necessarily more useful reports by including information already adequately provided by management in footnotes or MDNA. I was pleased to see that many audit committee members as well as the NACD provided input to the board to elaborate on the reasoning for this opposition. The other subject, not subject to this panel's discussion, relates to the auditor's responsibility regarding other information on which time permitting I will provide comment as that too is an element of the proposed changes I do not support as currently written. The specific areas to be addressed then in my comments today are auditor tenure, independence, and auditor's responsibility for financial statements and related notes and schedules and for fraud. While auditor tenure may be an interesting data point for some users of financial statements, I do not support its disclosure in the auditor's report. Auditor tenure, when taken out of context, has the potential to unnecessarily obscure the question of audit quality and perhaps cause some to erroneously conclude a direct correlation between tenure and audit quality, which to my knowledge, no verifiable correlation exists. Further, I do not think auditor tenure negatively impacts audit quality or independence. People and actions do. My experience has been that the engagement team on the ground and its ability to access specialized expertise within the firm provides the basis for sound audit quality, not the number of years a firm has audited a company. In addition, mandatory rotation limits the years senior members of the engagement team can audit, which provides a regular introduction of differing and fresh <laughs> perspective to the audit engagement. If tenure were to be introduced as an element of governance, the placement seems better situated in the proxy statement as part of the audit committee report or with the ratification of auditors. I have no objection with the recommendation to expand the auditor's report regarding independence However, having said this, I think it is important to underscore the significance of the ongoing review of audit quality by the audit committee and the use of audit committee executive sessions and other interactions with auditors to understand the nature and the quality of the engagement and to engage in dialogue about the independence, the integrity, the objectivity and competence of the engagement team and the firm in fulfilling its professional responsibility as the auditor. This ongoing review of audit quality is a core responsibility of the audit committee and provides a thoughtful basis of judgment regarding the audit quality we seek and provides a firm foundation for continuous improvement in audit quality from the auditor. I support the board's proposal to enhance the auditor's report by identifying financial statements, including related notes and schedules as part of the financial statements that were audited. I also support the proposal to revise the auditor's report to recognize the auditor's responsibility to plan and perform the audit to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free of material misstatements, whether caused by error or fraud. As noted at the onset, I would like to close with my brief perspective on auditor's responsibility regarding other information. 
As many have noted, clarification of work done by the auditors should be provided in the auditor's report. If the board determines it will move forward with this proposal in some form, I encourage the board to accept Deloitte's offer of assistance in the development of a workable model for expanded auditor involvement with other information. I further recommend that consideration be given first in a phased approach to the auditor's responsibility regarding quantitative non-GAAP measures. There are many instances when a company feels quantitative non-GAAP measures are more meaningful to users of their financial statements than GAAP measures. However, I would venture to say that auditor involvement in terms of evaluating the rigor around the process, the controls and testing of those non-GAAP quantitative disclosures is varied, and therein lays an opportunity to clarify what the auditor's responsibility for that information should be and how this responsibility should manifest in terms of auditor reporting. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Jim Lee. <clears throat> Thank you. Chairman Doty, members of the board, Chief Auditor Bauman, and other representatives of the PCAOB, SEC, and FASB, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you and share some perspectives on the PCAOB's auditor reporting model project and more specifically, to address the topic of auditor tenure and other potential changes to the auditor's report. Speaking on behalf of KPMG, we certainly support the board's objective to improve the auditor's reporting model and increase its relevance to financial statement users, and we are in favor of constructive and practical changes to the auditor's reporting model. However, as we have heard in certain of the panels, including the one just before us at lunch, Stakeholders are not necessarily aligned regarding the nature and extent of such changes. Investors, audit committees, auditors, and preparers have differing views on what information auditors should provide. This is an important project of great interest to many different stakeholders and one that requires careful deliberation to develop a solution that can be practically applied. We need to take our time to figure out what the markets need relative to what auditors are able to provide. We also need to be mindful of what's happening globally, and certainly over the last day and a half, we've gotten some great commentary in that particular regard. Moreover, we need to recognize and accept that no solution in this area will meet the desires of all stakeholders. In developing possible enhancements to the auditor's report, we have been guided by a set of principles including, one, auditors should not be the original source of information about the entity. Management's responsibility should be preserved in this regard. A fundamental shift from the auditor attesting to information prepared by management to the auditor providing original information about the company could result in unintended consequences that are not in the best interest of investors. Secondly, any changes to the auditor's reporting model should enhance or at least maintain audit quality. On behalf of the 7,000 folks in our audit practice in the United States, I can tell you that we're focused on audit quality each and every day, and our efforts of continuous improvement together with that of the board have very positively contributed to an increase in audit quality over the last dozen years or so. Third, any changes to the auditor's reporting model should narrow or at least not expand the expectation gap. Fourth, any changes to the auditor's reporting model should add value and not create investor misunderstanding. Specifically, any revision should not require investors to sort through what we refer to as dueling information provided by management, the audit committee, and or the independent auditors. And lastly, auditor reporting should focus on the objective rather than the subjective. Financial reporting matters assessed by the auditor can be highly subjective. However, it's important that auditor communications provide objective information about these matters. As it relates specifically to the topics of independence and tenure, we agree with the addition of language on auditor independence explicitly stating that the auditor is required to be independent. This is consistent with the requirement that the auditor's report be titled Report of Independent Registered Public Accounting Firm and provides clarification of this within the auditor's report. We do not believe, however, that the inclusion of a sentence about the auditor's tenure within the auditor's report is appropriate. As noted in the PCAOB release, no nexus has been established between an auditor's tenure and audit quality, 
and requiring such information in the auditor's report might give the false impression that a correlation between the two does in fact exist. We do, however, acknowledge that the communication of an auditor's tenure may be an item of interest to some stakeholders, and we support the communication and transparency that disclosing this information may provide. Therefore, we recommend that this information be required to be disclosed through different means, such as in Form 2, or as our other panelists today have indicated, in the Audit Committee's report. And finally, with respect to the topic of addressees of an auditor's report, we do not support addressing the auditor's report to parties other than shareholders and the board of directors or an equivalent body. We believe this would create additional litigation risk and would not improve the communicative value of the auditor's report. Adding addressees to the auditor's report will not affect those with access to it. The auditor's report is a general use report available to all capital market participants shareholders, bondholders, rating agencies, analysts, and others, that the issuer can distribute without restriction and to which third parties have ready access via the issuer's SEC filings. This concludes my prepared remarks. Thank you again for the opportunity per to participate in today's discussion, and I look forward to addressing any questions the Board might have on this important topic. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harris? Well, I, I would just agree with uh, Jim. I think it's important to focus on the objective, uh, narrow the expectation gap, and be mindful of, of what is happening globally on the audit quality. Uh, I don't have any questions. Uh, I, I think that uh, I heard from the previous panel um, what's happening in terms of uh, globally on the audit quality. I think it's different from what's happening here. I think the trend outside the United States is considerably different from what's going on in the United States. So. I think we do have to keep that in mind. Uh, I think the expectation gap is huge, uh, and I think everything ought to be done to attempt to narrow it because I think the, the, the focus of investors versus the profession is, is, is not narrowing, it's broadening. And so I was happy to hear from the last panel that there is increased dialogue, uh, and I agree that there ought to be a focus on the objective. So I don't, I don't have any questions, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I have a question, uh, section for all of you, but may be directed m uh, mostly to Ms. Amble, uh, because it appears as I listen to you that uh, your view is that the auditor at most should be commenting on disclosures by management and whether we put uh, the management talks about risks and audit policies in its footnotes or whatever, but they should be the source of the disclosure rather than the auditor. We just listened to a panel from the United Kingdom where the model has gone in a very different direction, and as far as I could tell, the investor response to that appears to have been overwhelmingly positive. That's point one. Point two, uh, it looks like the IAASB is about to adopt a standard that's very similar to ours. And so that there are two questions here, really. One, what should we make of the UK experience? Is it anomalous because it's the UK? Number two, do we run a risk as a nation if the international standard diverges significantly in terms of what auditors should do, that uh, we have a standard that does not really comport with that at all. So it's two questions, but if all, each of you could address it. I'd... In terms of, um, if I think, because you're, you're speaking to the critical audit matters at this, at this point, and as I think about that, there's a question about what is disclosed as having been done by the auditors. But to me, the bigger question is, is the concern that there, there is a view that the auditors are not doing enough? And I don't know how disclosure addresses that. And it would seem to me if the, if the issue is, number one, we think that auditors are not performing the appropriate uh, procedures, if we think that they are somehow the, the source of the um, issues that companies have had, whether it's financial failure or accounting misstatements, then I would address that issue, and I would address that in terms of, of the training, the, the audit uh, requirements that are out there, the protocols, and how they are monitored. But disclosing it only, as I read, you know, I read through the, um, one of the reports, the, I think it was the Rolls-Royce report on critical audit matters, and I found it to be very interesting in terms of what they did, but honestly, I didn't see anything that was astounding in terms of the audit procedures that were done. It made sense for the areas that they were auditing. So while I found it interesting, it wasn't necessarily that enlightening to me. 
I did see something that was interesting because on one of their comments, they mentioned that they talked about a design of control having a, a weakness, which to me is now getting at their assertions and their comments with regards to internal controls over financial reporting. But other than that, that was the only real substantive comment on that. And honestly, I think that's an area, if there were going to be any discussion, is worthy of more discussion in terms of what is done to ensure that the SOX processes are designed appropriately, the internal controls over financial reporting are designed appropriately, and that there's the right corporate culture to ensure that issues are appropriately um, raised and when raised are appropriately addressed. I don't know the critical audit matters get to that in itself. I would just hit, hit to the direct part of the issue. The second point that I would say is if there's a concern with the core responsibility of the audit committee, which is to look at the audit quality on a continual basis, not just an annual basis, then I would look to the performance of the audit committees and whether or not there needs to be more enlightening there. So I hear your point. Um, whether there's a divergence of practice, that in of itself does not create any substantial issues for me. There's divergence in how we account for matters, so in terms of how auditors discuss their, um, the, their audits, that is not disturbing to me in any way. I, I just don't know whether disclosure in of itself will improve audit quality, and if that's the desired objective, I don't know how disclosing and discussing it achieves that objective. I, I would uh, try to answer your question in rather broad terms. And drawing back to my earlier point that at one point, at one stage back in the early part of the prior decade, <clears throat> the U.S. was considered the leading country in the world in terms of investor protections, which I no longer think is the case. And I think the U.K., for example, experience shows how investor interest on particular questions gets enhanced as, as regulation or, in some ways, soft regulation through the manner in which Great Britain encourages these developments really does generate a better relationship between investors and, and companies, audit committees, and audit firms. I don't think, um, in response to the last comment, that it's an issue of concern in the, in the U.K. about the audit committee. I think the, the point, and, and it was raised in basically the presentation of this roundtable, that there's currently an asymmetry in terms of regulation, in terms of what the company knows, its audit committee deals with, and what investors know. And in the interest of investor protection, I think this asymmetry ought to be narrowed and I think the proposals of the PCLB go in that, in that direction, and that's why I support them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'll, you know, I'm going to refer back to our comment letter because if you think about the, the core objective of the, 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 the project at hand, you know, we do have a responsibility at present, you know, relative to the information that's, that's in MD&A, specifically as it relates to critical accounting estimates and such, but the practical reporting in that regard is on an exception basis, meaning if there's information therein, that's material inconsistent with the information that we've gained in the performance of the audit. Um, we believe actually one of the, the best ways to, to help achieve the objective that the board has laid out is to require auditor association with that particular information in MD&A. Now, that would require some changes, and what I mean by that is we'd have to, um, the SEC would have to require that the critical accounting estimate section be clearly identified within MD&A. Um, they'd have to review uh, existing interpretive guidance uh, to determine uh, how it fits in within the context of Regulation XK. But then we'd also have to, from a PCAOB perspective, look at the existing attestation standard and see what we could do therein to more formally associate the external auditor with the critical accounting estimate section within MD&A. Thank you. Um, I guess the way I look at this as an issuer is, and maybe I shouldn't, but if, if the auditor is being relied on to tell the investor so much, I almost feel like I've failed in my disclosure attempts as a preparer. 
it, it seems in a in a perfect world, I should be giving all the information that's needed to the investor on the estimates and the other more difficult things to account for an audit, which would leave the auditor almost uh, rehashing what generally accepted auditing standards are, which is, I know, not, not the point of all this. So I feel like we've got to look at, as issuers uh, internally at where are we failing, where we need an auditor to, to pick up for us. Maybe that's not the way we should look at it, but that's kind of the way I hear it. Um, as far as the UK comment, the only thing I can say is there are differences in the environment. The accounting is fundamentally different, as we all know, between IFRS and US GAAP. Um, as Peter pointed out, there's differences in the role of the audit committee and the audit committee chairman. And so I think it's almost unavoidable to have some differences well, and not to mention, we, we, it's been pointed out, we are in a litigious society in the United States. Um, it seems inevitable there'll be some differences, but I don't think we can just accept that there will be differences and go on. We should narrow the gap. And I think the last thing I'd say to Mr. Harris is I, I really take what you had to say to heart. I, I feel like you seem almost disappointed in us. So um, we as issuers of the financial statements don't want to have the PCAOB kind of throwing their hands up and, and uh, not, not being happy with what we're doing. So I, I really listen to what you have to say. Well, I, I appreciate that and we obviously want to work, work very closely with you. Jay? One primary question that is based on something that, that, Joan, you had in your statement, but I'm going to direct it first to Jim and then let the rest of you uh, comment, and then, and then separately I've got a different question for, for Peter. So uh, on the, on the uh, point you made, uh, Joan, about the independence assertion in the audit report and the importance of the audit committee's role in the dialogue with the auditor about their independence, their objectivity, their skepticism, their competence, it uh, just sparked kind of a tangential question that, uh, that I'll uh, start with Jim about. But what, uh, at KPMG, what do you do to help educate audit committees and management about their role in making sure that the auditor is, is independent within the specific independence rules around scope of services and, and, and things like that, which, which uh, as, as some of us know, is an incredibly complex book of, of rules that sometimes, at least in my view, are not always easy to, to, inter to figure out what the, what the right answer is. And, and just curious about what you do to help educate effectively the possible buyer of the services, like you educate all of your professionals as the sellers of the services. And then, and Joan and Monty, your, your experience with, uh, as, as the preparers and audit committee members. And so I'll, I'll pause for a second to, to let you answer. But, but Peter, my, my question for you is just slightly um, uh, different from that in that, uh, um, uh, on, the, on the auditor tenure question, um, your three co-panelists have each suggested, well, they don't object to tenure, but it's better placed in the audit committee report. And I'm just kind of curious as to your reaction to their, uh, their uh, um, um, positions on that. So I'll start with Jim. Well, it's, um, that particular question, I think we've got to recognize that when you look across the, the spate of public companies that we, we are associated with, there's different levels of maturities within those companies themselves, and you tend to find in, in the larger companies in particular that there's a level of maturity there, not only with respect to the auditor independence rules, but there, there's a better and more uh, comprehensive understanding of the roles and responsibilities of management, um, as well as the roles and responsibilities of the auditors per se. Now, certainly, whether it be a mature company or or one that um, is, is, I want to say, less mature. Um, there's a fair amount of dialogue, obviously, at, d at different points of the year, presentation of the audit plan, uh, a very um, a specific discussion of our responsibilities, a compare and contrast to management's responsibilities. So, I mean, the more f most fundamental way it gets achieved, quite frankly, is through regular and ongoing dialogue about the auditor's responsibilities and making sure that there's absolute transparency from an audit committee in, uh, perspective. In terms of, um, I'll speak to what um, approach we've taken on audit committees, um, it's really no different than when you're working in a company as well, but there's a, num there's a number of different things and there are a lot of good opportunities. One thing which I think is very helpful is continuing education. Whether that, whatever form that is, going, being part of different professional organizations and currently, 
having highlighted what responsibilities are and best practices and what people are doing. That is very, very helpful to keep that, keep that in front of you in terms of important things to think about, particularly looking how companies are growing and are so much more complex today, which means the audit of those companies is obviously going to be more complex. So in terms certainly what I, what I do on the, my audit committees is I really look very seriously at whether or not the auditors being assigned have grown with the company and their skills match the skills that are requisite for the risks when they, inherent within the company, just as you would look at the finance organization within the organization as well. The other thing is to look very ser seriously and not to allow it be reduced to five minutes is how you engage in the executive sessions with the auditors. That's the time when people can just really talk very clearly and you can get into issues potentially um, in a more in-depth way and taking advantage of that and how the auditors respond gives you a very good indication of independence. I know there are a lot of independence rules in terms of the investments and so on. I, and I assume the firm does that very, very well. What we will look to is the character of the individual and do they understand the culture of the company well enough so that issues are being appropriately raised and when they are being raised, they know how to deal with the difficult conversations if you ever have any. I mean, that is so important to be able to do that, just as it's important for management as well. Um, the other thing is, is really the offline discussions you have as well. Anybody knows if they're an audit committee chair that your job goes well beyond the audit meetings. There's a lot that happens in the preparatory meetings where you meet with management in advance of the meeting um, to go through the agenda and the particular topics um, that will be addressed. But then you also meet with the auditors as well. And again, those discussions give you what I call the ability to have the Ouija board test to understand the talent of the team and how seriously they're looking at things and if they're looking at the right things. So those are some of, some of the, certainly not all, but some of the things that I think are pretty common with audit committees and audit committee chairs. Yeah, I'm fortunate to work at a company that does have a very strong focus on governance. We have a very strong audit committee, the very strong chairman of our audit committee, and, and a lot of the culture flows from that. Um, I think uh, similar to Joan, we have a very robust, more offline process of discussing issues with the audit committee and, uh, and getting the reaction. I think there's a healthy amount of respect between the audit firm and, and the company and the audit committee that also helps. Um, there's, I would say, I wouldn't use the word tension, but there is healthy challenge that goes uh, back and forth and, and it, it never causes a problem. Um, part of that is the strong governance culture. I think uh, in terms of the, the auditor getting involved in helping the company with governance, I kind of have a, a different perspective on that with the company for which I'm on the audit committee, which is the, in some ways the opposite of Verizon. It's a small private company and, and there it's almost indispensable. The uh, the work that the auditor performs in helping the company understand how to how to uh, govern better. If I could go immediately to the questions uh, that, that you posed to me. Um, first, I thought I was actually in agreement with uh, Monty Garrett that disclosure is appropriate. He puts it in the uh, proxy statement um, as opposed to the auditor report, which is the focus of this discussion. Uh, I would note that that's voluntary, that there is no requirement that Verizon or any other company do that. And uh, the reality for the investment world is very few companies do what Verizon does do. There are some that do. Um, so I'll then uh, try to address the other comments from the two panelists that oppose, for example, the inclusion of the tenure of the particular auditor in the audit report. Um, and here I'll, I'll start at the risk of what you can generalize from an anecdotal experience. When I was at TI Cref, we shifted from one audit firm to another. And one of the benefits to us as an organization was that the second audit firm, which the first audit firm was high quality. They did a terrific job. The second audit firm, took a second look at some of the questions that had been seemingly resolved with the first audit firm. And in retrospect now, as I view that experience, there were a couple of instances of that. It was a healthy development to go through as an organization somebody that has a second look at, at issues, 
that were resolved one way and see how they um, might be resolved in, in another way. Apart from that, I, I do take issue with the notion that inclusion of auditor tenure could be misleading. And basically, I think that is, uh, uh, to, to make that right, you'd have to believe that investors just don't know how to use the information that's disclosed to them, and I would challenge that notion. I think if you surveyed some of the key institutional investors, they believe that auditor tenure going to the issue ultimately of auditor independence, and it's not just technical independence. I think there are a few instances where auditor tenure might affect a situation where auditor independence um, was lacking in the past, but there's auditor independence and there's auditor independence. And getting back to the second look aspect of it, I, I think that's extremely valuable. So I would say that there should be more trust that investors that think it's valuable will use it appropriately. Investors that think it has no value could ignore it. It's a, it's, it's a disclosure that you could require that imposes no costs on the investors that don't care about auditor tenure. But I believe, just like in the British experience, that once these issues get onto the table, you will find more dialogue, more interest on the part of institutional investors and other investors. And you'll have examples of where a particular audit firm has been the auditor for a particular company for decades, and that will give investors the opportunity to at least ask questions about it, and right now they don't have the information, and that's why I would strongly support the PCOB making that disclosure re a requirement. Just a couple rea reactions, and, and when I, when I po posed my question, it was really uh, a context I didn't, didn't describe, which is in the imaginary world that the SEC would take up the issue of making it required in a proxy statement so it wasn't just voluntarily, which, uh, which as Brian has observed, there or we have observed lots of things on the SEC's agenda, and we have no ability to, to uh, impose that uh, on the SEC, and, and uh, there might be several things that might be worthy for them to take up. And the other just, just uh, re reflection and, um, and a little bit of a surprise at what, what you've said is that, that for the analyst that wants to know how long a company's been, uh, an audit firm has been, been a company's auditor, at least uh, I'm not a, a, an expert in using the SEC's online uh, filing uh, search system, but uh, in any company I've tried to figure it out, I could figure it out in about two or three minutes. The auditor changes within the last 20 years uh, on the uh, the Edgar system, and so, so it's not hard to find. Uh, so I, it just kind of surprised me that those that want it can't find it. Do you want to respond to that, Peter? Yeah, there's lots of things that could be required conveniently in the way of disclosure to make the information convenient without going into an elaborate process, even if it's doable. Um, and again, I come back to the question that this is a costless requirement to put in information of this sort that some investors, and I would suggest that most of the institutional investors will find this information in potentially important and interesting uh, to make that disclosure better for them is, is a positive thing the PCOB could do. Jeanette Franzel. This has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, many of the panelists here have touched on issues which we've been hearing uh, throughout these two days, and it's really an issue of, gee, does some of this really belong in the auditor's report. Uh, should the auditor be uh, reporting on original disclosures or should management be doing it? Should the audit committee be putting some of this into the audit committee report uh, you know, or the in the proxy statement? Um, you know, and unfortunately, the reality is our system of regulation over financial reporting and, and governance and disclosure is fragmented. Um, and so here we are at the PCAOB identifying, you know, potential disclosures that might be helpful to investors. And the only thing we can do is require that it be thrown into the auditor's report. And so I think that in some cases we're hearing discussion uh, or we're hearing disagreement on certain uh, issues that would be of, of great value to some investors, but re the, the real 
um, disagreement is putting it into the auditor's report. And, uh, you know, so I guess we could always just keep requiring more and more in the audit report, but at some point, you know, some of these issues of uh, critical accounting policies and MD&A and, and, and tweaks that maybe need to be made on the uh, on management side so that then the auditor can take a different role would strengthen the system, uh, you know, in its entirety. So I have that, that concern, um, and I would like just to hear your comments uh, in terms of how concerned are you about that. Maybe it's not a big concern. Uh, maybe we can compensate, you know, for all of the problems in the disclosure system by putting it all into the auditor's report. But I think at some point the fragmentation here will cause risk and it will cause proposals that may not be the best solutions. And, and I guess what really caused me to go down this line of thinking was Peter's comment that, in his opinion, the disclosure system presently is flawed in material respects. Um, well, if that's the case, I'm not sure we can solve it all through the auditor's report, but I'd appreciate any comments or thoughts that you all have on that, how it relates to some of the things we've been talking about. And I see I just caused Brian to raise his, his uh, name card as well. So. <laughs> I think it is interesting the way you describe that, that it's it's a bit fragmented and, you know, you have your purview over the auditor's report and is that really the best way to address some of these things? And I think our opinion is maybe maybe not, um, especially with the items like the, the CAMs. Um, again, it, it just feels strange to have the auditor giving giving information other than just their basic audit, audit steps, which as I think about it, aren't those really available? I mean, you you have steps. Everyone uses the same steps to audit certain things. It's prescribed. Um, so if there's a, a shortfall, it, it seems it's up to the company to, to beef up the disclosures on what things. Again, if it was hard to audit, it was also hard to account for. Um, so if that's the, the problem we're trying to solve, and we do need to solve it if investors are concerned about it, to me it doesn't seem like the audit report is the way to do that. Jim Croker had his uh, flag up first. Did any of the other panelists want to comment on that? I guess if I may, I'll just make one anecdotal comment. And I think back to, to my many years in practice when I'd go and I'd talk to the financial uh, management people at a particular audit client and we would um, uh, I would I would discuss as it relates to a particular transaction or estimate or policy statement or whatever and talk about disclosure in the underlying financial statements and someone would invariably say, well, that's in the 10K. You yeah, know, well, it's in MD&A per se, but it's not in the financial statements and we think it's particularly important that it be included in there and uh, I think that's an important point because at the end of the day, uh, when we put an audit opinion on a set of financial statements, we've got to be satisfied that there is reasonable and appropriate disclosure of all those matters that are important from an investor perspective in terms of understanding those financial statements taken as a whole. And um, I'm not commenting about the disclosure framework, you know, overall, but I am I am talking to that it. Um, I think it's a pretty important part of our job to evaluate those financial statements and make sure that the discussions are appropriate uh, in the context of the financials as a whole. Um, since you brought it up, uh, which goes outside of the topics of the discussion today, I think it would be fabulous if the SEC and the FASB and the PCOB could be in concert on a number of things. And I think one area where, I mean, a lot of the some of the discussions and pushback that you've heard is the volume of the financial statements just becomes very substantial, and they're already very substantial. And part of the culprit for the volume of the financial statements is there is duplication, because you do have two different bodies, the SEC and the FASB, requiring information, and you can't always cross-reference, sometimes you cannot cross-reference in all cases for them to be complete. So I think anything to take away the duplication and things that add no value um, if they could in, in the way in which they're presented today would, would be a wonderful thing. I also think having clear line of sight of responsibilities for each of the organizations being adhered to so that you don't bring in things that are interesting and nice to know but really not directly un, under um, that organization's purview. I think that would be you know, something very positive. 
I also think if you were to get the MDNA and the financials more consolidated, you may also have the opportunity to have SOX oversee more than just financial controls. One of the biggest concerns I have with non-GAAP measurements is they're not under SOX. And arguably, if that is more important to investors and that moves the needle on your stock price, it would seem to me that the standards required for GAAP measurements should be at a minimum of what should be required for those. And today they're not under SOX. And so, and I know that because that it's, it was something that was not determined to be part of the basic financial statements, and I, I would disagree with that. I would think that you should have it expand to that as well. So that's kind of going beyond your question, but getting to would it be nice for all of the standard setters to kind of coalesce, I think that would be great if they were sitting here potentially and not us. Peter, I'm going to get, I'm going to get back to you, but I want to give FASB and the SEC a chance. Actually, your, your remarks are a good segue to the question I had. One, I think we do have a fabric that, that works well together. Um, you know, obviously our responsibility is much narrower than the SEC's comprehensive authority with respect to accounting standards that, that, that we have, but I think we do work complementary together, but just personal view. Uh, but, Jim, you mentioned earlier the issue of auditing of or assurance or some type of um, attestation around critical accounting policies, critical accounting estimates, and it occurs to me uh, in the vein of duplication, at least potentially, and there's a lot of complaint about footnote one often and how does that correspond to critical accounting policies. That one way to address that, uh, again, speaking for one person from the FASB, would be for us to consider bringing more directly the obligations that are existing in MDNA, and I get we'd have to deal with staff interpretations and other things, but to bring that into the financial statements, uh, that could accomplish two things. One, reduction at least of confusion about whether there's duplication, but also then bring in directly an auditor attestation requirement specifically to things that are already often covered in the context of an audit. But I wonder if, if you or others had reaction on, on that. Uh, my only reaction, quite frankly, is I think, you know, we're, we're raising it in the context that a dialogue in this, this vein, you know, we think is, is both reasonable and appropriate when you think about the core um, objective of the, 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 the reporting model standard here. And, and, and we'd welcome a dialogue about it to figure out the best way to provide the information that's of most value to investors and potentially at the least cost to the companies themselves. If I could just have one final um, crack at your question, it, it would be we got to deal with the situation that we got to deal with. That, that, that's, that's my perspective on it. I've urged the SEC to include disclosure about um, auditor tenure as Verizon voluntarily does. Um, we might be having a different conversation if the SEC had done it or will do it, but. From an investor perspective, I think it comes back, and, and you made the point earlier, um, that I think there's a material flaw in the disclosure, disclosure system now, and there's something that PCAOB can do about it. Uh, there's something the SEC can do about it, and uh, I'd encourage each to move on it, and that's, I, I guess, where, where I come down on your broad question. I'm not through with you yet, Peter. Brian? Thank you. I, I just wanted to follow on um, from Jeanette's remarks and actually, um, Peter, your, your remarks and actually some of what, what Jim has now just said. And now is probably a good time just to remind that, that these are my own, my own, my own views. But um, with, with respect to what the SEC can or can't do, I, I just want to comment that, you know, in the seven or eight years that I've been now involved in, in this, I've been involved in making recommendations to the Commission on nearly all of the PCOB standards that they've developed thus far, and not once have we made a recommendation so far that says we recommend that the Commission adopt this because you're too busy to do something that would be better or more appropriate. And I, I certainly don't think we should start that now is my own, my own view. So to the extent that, um, that that was the basis for my comment yesterday, to the extent that uh, commenters still believe that there's something the SEC should be doing or that the disclosure, a disclosure would be better placed in the Audit Committee report. I'm glad that we're still hearing those kinds of comments, and I encourage those kinds of comments because I don't think we should start with the presumption that the Commission wouldn't do something or couldn't do something. And so I, I really appreciate the feedback that we're getting in that regard, and we'll, uh, we'll continue to, to listen to that. 
I'm uh, mystified um, a bit. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the panels uh, to a matter that Lewis alluded to, and that's the fact that Europe is moving ahead, um, the UK moving ahead, and the concern that we might not be um, right there in the vanguard of disclosure. Whether that will translate into um, different capital, uh, different costs of capital for us in the long run, we don't know. But one of the things the board, I think, must worry about is the potential that after some years it will translate into some differential in the uh, premium which our, which our equity markets enjoy and which uh, the charges for which capital uh, exacts, uh, sources of capital exact their, their funds. And the confidence that they have in the, uh, the completeness of the, re of the regimen of the regime of disclosure and the enforcement of the regime of disclosure seems to be, if we're, if we're reading uh, the sources correctly, if we're reading the academic research correctly, that seems to be something that does translate at the cost of capital. And uh, Verizon uh, discloses this tenure uh, matter for some reason. If you, if you put aside just the fact that other, that other advanced capital centers are, are making the disclosures that we have asked you to comment on, and if you look at just what we are doing or not doing, it would seem to me that preparers, directors, uh, audit committee people, uh, auditors ought all to be concerned that if there's something we can do here that gives investors information which they have been asking for for over a decade, in some cases decades, um, and if we can do that without uh, increasing a great deal of the cost of obtaining and delivering that information, we ought to seriously consider doing it. And I would be surprised if in Jim Liddy's long and distinguished career as an auditor, Jim, if you had never seen a case in which the, um, the desire of a young auditor not to lose or vex a promising or a valued client uh, had never prejudiced that lawyer, that uh, accountant's uh, views. Um, the point being, I don't think it's possible to prove, to, to prove the negative here and to say that there is no relationship between tenure and independence. There's no relationship between tenure and skepticism. And therefore, I am, I am puzzled with how you deal with Peter Clapman's position as, as an investor and as a former CREF official, that this is something that investors want. How do you face your, your investors and say, we think you can't handle the information, we don't believe you can use it, we don't know that it's useful, we think it may confuse you, we think you may make precipitous judgments based on tenure. You have the entire proxy statement. You've got a lot of things uh, available, many megaphones available to management. Megaphones available to audit firms that KPMG uses regularly in the reports that they issue on why it is that, um, in fact, the, the retention and the choice of an auditor is a complicated matter. Many things have to be valued. Many things have to be weighed. But why would it be that we would want to deny this information to investors now when that is in many ways the easiest, the best known, and the cheapest kind of information to include in an audit report, and it has the risk that if we don't do this, we're actually withholding something that, that looks to the investor, that, show, that is perceived by the capital markets as being something that diminishes the completeness of our disclosure regime and the enforceability of our disclosure regime. We are putting ourselves at risk, possibly, on cost of capital. Why do you want to do that? Anybody? If I may, I'll start. I mean, <clears throat> just to make it clear, I mean, um, this information may very well be important to investors, and we're actually supportive of the idea of communication and transparency regarding the, the concept of auditor tenure. I guess our objection relates to specifically including it in the auditor's report, and it, and it relates to a specific correlation being made between the tenure number and whether that is reflective on audit quality or not. 
But Jim, um, that's your most immediate communication with your stakeholders, with your investing public, is your report. I, I don't disagree with that, but I, again, I think you know from our vantage point, we're supportive of you know greater transparency about it. We see a much you know growing, growing number of companies that are, as a normal practice, disclosing it in their audit committee reports. We also think it is a matter of convenience that can be done in the form two as well. I've actually been on both sides of the fence on this one. My initial reaction when I read the proposal was, what's the problem, put it in, it doesn't cost anything. Um, it was really after thinking about it further that I thought, you know, it really isn't though an audit matter per se, it's really a governance, it's a governance issue. I mean, if I had my druthers, I'd rather have the auditor sign the report personally. I mean, to me that would, I know that's not a very popular position to take, but to me that's more important the individual who is responsible for that audit engagement and ensuring that everything, all of the professional responsibilities have been discharged appropriately. That is much more important to me. I think from an audit committee perspective, it's important to look at the duration of the audit firm. But quite frankly, whether it's one year or 30 years, it, it still boils down to the people, the feet on the ground, the people that are there in the engagement and how they're responding to the needs and risks of the company. So. Like I said, I think if, it, if it's deemed important for everyone to disclose it from a governance perspective, put it in the proxy. Um, two of my three firms where I'm on the audit committee, we do disclose it, but it's not for the gallant reasons that you just described. I mean, one disclosed it, but they're challenging whether they want to anymore because they thought it was a good thing to say that we've had these, the same auditor for a number of years and we've developed a, a very positive and thoughtful relationship ensuring quality audits. Um, that now that they're seeing that people are seeing that tenure might connote something negative, they're wondering, gee, I wonder if that wasn't a good disclosure. The other one had it in because we had changed auditors because we had merged firms and one firm had one auditor, another had another, so you had to pick one and so it was required to, put it, to be put in and it was just kept over for the last couple of years. So, and I, and I, my guess is there are probably other people in that same camp camp as well. So well I, well, I think it's, you know, I think it's an interesting disclosure. I think when you speak of it in context of how uh, the audit committee may evaluate that, I think that's very relevant. Um, so putting it in the proxy, I'm not objecting to at all, but there are a lot of other interesting things that you could put in the audit report that we're not talking about that I don't think are as high a priority, personally. If I could make, uh, Jim, one, one further comment in the nature of prediction that if there is disclosure of the tenure of audit firms, I think what you will do in this country is have a healthy debate, some of which has been aired at this panel, as to whether it's important, whether it serves the interests of investors and, and, and the public interest. But I think it's a debate that is needed. And I think if you did have that disclosure, it would encourage more dialogue, um, and I think this would be a healthy thing for, for the system. I'm afraid that the times Ferguson and I both um, have evidence frustration that we're not law professors. Um, so I hope you will forgive me for trying uh, to push the Socratic method a little on you on the, on the law professor, professorial note. Uh, I think Jay did a good, a good job of arguing with the witness, Peter, and arguing with you on uh, this issue. So this, the kind this has been a panel in which there's been a lot of give and take. Steve, you want one more give and take? Yeah, uh, uh, no. Mr. Garrett, just so you understand uh, where, where I'm coming from, I, I didn't want to leave any misimpression. Uh, the mission of the PCOB very specifically is defined in Section 101. It's unequivocal and it's in quotes, and that's the preparation of informative, accurate, and independent reports, audit reports. So. My perspective is how can we make the audit report more informative? And so I, I, I want to elicit from as many people as I can, you know, a marketplace of ideas for how we improve the audit report. That's my perspective. Thank you. We have a panel waiting, but this one has been terrific. Thank you all. And we will see you soon. Yeah. I'll, in, I'll, I'll introduce the next panel as they're coming in. Charles Pagano is a partner at Weiser Mazars, and his industry experience includes broker-dealers and financial services. He's currently a member of the AICPA and the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association in their Compliance and Legal Division, 
as well as the Financial Management Division. He's a current member of the NYSSPA, the uh, Stock Brokerage Committee. He chairs the Foundation of Accounting Education, Education's annual technical conferences on audit issues of broker dealers and their annual conference on the securities industry. Michael Fairman is a managing director and head of the Accounting Policy and Advisory Group of the Americas at Deutsche Bank, in addition to providing transaction advisory services and financial statement review, he undertakes special products projects throughout the bank and participates in various valuation and control oversight uh, committees. Previously, Michael Fairman was a member of the accounting policy team at Goldman Sachs and held various positions at UBS. John Corcoran is a former vice president of MFG Financial MFS investment management. He also serves as the fund president's president of the MSS, MFS funds and fund treasurer for the MFS Meridian funds. In his role, he manages the financial reporting, tax fund administration, custody and accounting oversight, and valuation functions of MFS. Prior, previ previously, he was a senior vice president of State Street, where his roles included managing the integration of investors bank and trust holding senior positions in fund administration and serving as the managing director of State Street's office in Edinburgh. Jeff Burgess is Grant Thornton's national managing partner at Professional Standards. Earlier, he was the partner in charge of the firm's National Professional Practice Director Group and the National Professional Practice Director for the Southeast Region at Grant Thornton. He's also served as the partner in charge of the Greensboro, North Carolina office and is the professional standards partner for the Carolinas practice. This panel is here to discuss considerations specific to investment companies and broker leaders, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Charles? Thank, thank you, Chairman Doty. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this PCOB public meeting. As the leader of my firm's broker dealer practice and former two-time chair of the New York State Society of CPA's Stock Brokerage Committee, and current member of that committee, I welcome the opportunity to express views on the proposal. The Mazars Group includes 14,000 professionals in 70 countries, and Wiser Mazars LLP here in the U.S. includes 100 partners and 650 professionals in six U.S. offices. We are the auditor for small issuers with less than $0.5 billion in market cap and broker-dealers which range from small to medium-sized firms non-clearing firms, including retail, trading, investment banking, and firms with net capital ranging from 20,000 to 3 billion, employees from three to several hundred. For purposes of this discussion, I will define small broker dealers as those which are noted in the proposal by the PCOB's Office of Research and Analysis, specifically those BDs which comprise approximately 2,200 2, of the approximately 4,200 BDs in the U.S. and which have a minimum net capital of only $5,000. Also noted by ORA, 1,700 have revenues of less than a million and only 9% of the BDs are subsidiaries of issuers who presumably are audited under PCOB standards as part of the parent subsidiary consolidations. Only 311 of the 4,200 broker dealers are subject to the Customer Protection Rule, SEC Rule 15C3-3. The vast majority hold no customer funds or securities. The purpose of the proposed rule is to allow investors to enhance their ability to make investment decisions and for other financial users, which in the case of broker-dealers would be the regulators. As noted in the proposal, approximately 90% of the BDs are directly owned by an individual or an entity that owns more than 50% of the broker-dealer, and approximately 75% have five or fewer direct owners, who the ORA suggests, and as my experience, are often active in the business. Investors do not invest in the broker-dealer proper. When a broker-dealer attempts to track capital, it will look to bring in other active shareholders or subordinated lenders who are generally existing shareholders. Therefore, we believe that investor would not benefit from the proposed change as they are not investing in the broker-dealer. The other financial users are the regulators. The BD industry is heavily regulated with a robust surveillance system in place 
That includes FINRA, the SEC, the CFTC, and state regulators. There will also be additional auditing oversight under PCOB standards for years ending after June 1, 2014, which will allow potential referral by the PCOB to regulators. If enacted, many BDs will have common critical audit matters that are already addressed in other reporting areas. Disclosure and information available to users, namely the regulators, is more than adequate in areas that are common to many BDs. For example, valuation of securities and revenue recognition, which are both addressed in comprehensive footnote disclosures. The net capital computation, which is addressed in a required supplementary schedule and is extensively audited and disclosed, and compliance with the exemptive provisions of Rule 15C3-3, the Customer Protection Rule. The additional cost of applying PCB auditing standards number seven, effective June 2014, along with the implementation of other PCB auditing standards, have already added incremental audit costs to the small broker dealer. A small broker dealer will be asked to absorb additional costs if the proposed auditing standards are enacted. A mid-size auditing firm's additional manpower cost to comply with the proposed reporting requirements for critical audit matters would include incremental time incurred by a senior, a manager, a partner, an EQR, an engagement quality control reviewer, in-house and possibly outside counsel, and other firm experts or specialists to issue a report. The BD is asked to issue a report within 60 days of year end. This existing time constraint with the possibility of additional reporting requirements if enacted and applied to broker dealers is a more stringent time frame for a more significant public companies which may have 75 or 90 day uh, filing requirement. There is a concern that additional reporting with these time constraints may affect order quality in the race to get reports issued to meet existing deadlines. Documentation of critical audit areas in compliance with the auditing standard number three may be more burdensome and costly. Depending on the capabilities of the, the order, given a similar fact pattern, different auditors may produce different results. Thus, the playing field may not be level for different sized accounting firms and their clients. The August 2013 second report on the progress of the interim inspection program noted that of 783 accounting firms that ordered BDs for the 2012 audit year, 656 or 83% of those firms ordered only one to five broker dealers each, while 14 firms or 2% ordered 51 or more BDs. I suspect that this might be somewhat price driven. Some BDs may, in the interest of saving dollars, look for those auditors who can perform less costly audits and in some cases, quality may suffer. Given the statistics already acknowledged by the PCOB, including the size of the majority of the BDs, the size of the accounting firms that order them, and the likelihood that no useful additional information may be gained by additional requirements, we believe broker dealers should be excluded from the proposed standards. Our lack of support for certain aspects of the proposed audit standards, including their effect on issuers, as noted in our December 9, 2000 letter to the PCOB, primarily relate to the conviction that we should not supplant the responsibilities of management or audit committees. We remain committed to participating in future discussions with the board and staff to further enhance audit quality. We thank you for today's opportunity to participate. Thank you, Mr. Fairman. Thank you very much for the opportunity to appear today and to present Deutsche Bank's views on this topic. Deutsche Bank is a global universal bank and one of the largest financial institutions in the world. To facilitate the products and services we offer, we have a wholly owned broker-dealer subsidiary in the United States, Deutsche Bank Securities Incorporated, or DBSI. Because Deutsche Bank is an SEC registrant, our auditors are subject to inspection by the PCAOB. As DBSI is a broker-dealer, broker the audits of its separate financial statements are also subject to inspection. We support the goal of enhancing the information provided to users of financial statements, but believe the information should be presented by management. In our view, any critical audit matter would most likely be a critical accounting matter as well, and therefore already discussed by the issuer. At best, therefore, discussion of critical audit matters would seem to be redundant. 
Accordingly, we do not support this proposal in its current form. I've been asked to comment on issues that this proposal would present to broker-dealers for their financial statements. While there are certain issues related specifically to broker-dealers, I believe many of the concerns we have with the proposal would be shared by other preparers of financial statements. But I will begin with the matters that are specific to broker-dealers. As you know, many broker-dealers do not provide a complete set of financial statements to their customers and instead provide only a balance sheet with limited disclosures. It is highly likely that an auditor would find that there are critical audit matters resulting from income statement or disclosure information that is not included in the information provided to customers by a preparer. Similarly, auditor comments on responsibilities regarding other information would have little meaning to the user if the information itself is not included in the report. If those comments are to be included in the customer report, it will raise confusion for the user of the report. Clearly, the intent of this proposal is to add clarity and not confusion for the reader, and we believe this matter should be addressed during this exposure stage. We see this matter as an indication that perhaps application of the proposal to broker-dealers may not have received the same attention as for other entities. While I very much appreciate the opportunity to comment on matters relevant to a broker-dealer, I do not believe my appearance today can adequately address the concerns of the whole industry. Accordingly, I would respectfully suggest that an additional outreach effort be made, particularly to smaller broker-dealers who may not have had the regular practice of responding to matters such as this. Since PCAOB standards have only recently been applied to audits of broker-dealers, and given the small size and closely held nature of many broker-dealers, I'm concerned that there could be significant matters that may be brought to light only with a more targeted effort to solicit input from the industry across all its segments. One other aspect directly affecting broker-dealers is that the industry is already subject to significant regulation and oversight in both business practices, maintenance of capital levels, and financial statement presentation. Coupling that with the fact that broker-dealer financial statements are more often used by customers of broker-dealers rather than investors, we question whether applying this proposal, proposal to broker-dealers will yield significant benefits that are not already addressed by existing regulations and oversight. At a minimum, we would like to suggest that the PCAOB give further consideration to excluding broker-dealers from this proposal. There are other concerns that apply to companies in general but may be more acute for broker-dealers. For example, Complex business activities and the related management judgments applied are more likely to result in critical audit matters than are simple business activities. We are concerned that certain complex matters would almost always be cited by auditors as a critical audit matter. For example, hard-to-value securities such as Level 3 securities would likely be named as a critical audit matter for many broker-dealers. As a result, rather than adding clarity for the user, there is a risk that such matters would come to be viewed as boilerplate disclosure and be ignored by the user. On the other hand, a user of financial statements could react very negatively to all critical audit matters and reach an incorrect conclusion that critical audit matters are indicators of problems in the broker-dealer's business. Given the extent of discussion of Level 3 assets in both notes to financial statements and MD&A, <coughs> pardon me, there seems to be little information content to be gained from having them as a critical audit matter as well. Further, a decision that something is a critical audit matter could be the result of the individual auditor's knowledge and comfort level rather than an assessment of the matter itself. Of course, this concern is also applicable to financial institutions in general and is not limited to broker-dealers. There may be other examples of critical audit matters that would become either false red flags or boilerplate language that would be ignored for both financial institutions and other industries as well. We all know that the number of pages included in both quarterly and annual reports has steadily increased in recent years. Nowhere is this more true than for financial firms of all types. Adding to the sheer volume of the material is the fact that much of the information is very complex as well. Both the complexity of the business itself and the increasing requirements of accounting standards contribute to this increase in length and complexity of financial reports. Companies spend very substantial resources in preparing and explaining information and trying to do so in the most understandable way possible. The result, however, is a perennial call for simplification and elimination of disclosure overload. Adding an additional view or set of commentary will certainly not help this situation. As noted at the beginning of these remarks, we support efforts for increased transparency in providing additional useful information to users of financial statements. We do not think it should be the role of auditors to do so, and we cannot support the proposal as it currently exists. Thank you for your time. John Corcoran. 
Well, I'd like to thank the PCAOB for having us here today and, and to hear our comments. And I'd also like to thank you for saving what we think is the best panel for last. Um, <laughs> Today I'm going to focus my comments on how the proposal impacts uh, investment companies. And to put my role into perspective, at, at MFS we, would, we have over 140 U.S. mutual funds that we're issuing financial statements on, representing $170 billion in assets under management. U.S. investment companies as a whole are responsible for the investment of nearly $14 trillion in assets, and most of that being in mutual funds that have 92 million shareholders, and there's approximately 10,000 investment companies that are subject to an annual audit requirement and oversight by the PCAOB and the SEC. As we stated in our letter, uh, in our comment letter to the PCAOB, we do understand the PCAOB's overall objective to improve the value and relevance of the audit report and support many of the proposed changes. But there are certain aspects of the changes proposed that we do have concerns with, especially as they relate to investment companies. So first, let's talk about where we support the changes. Under the proposal, the auditor's report would be modified to include a statement that the auditor is registered with the PCAOB and is required to be independent. It also recommends the auditor's report more specifically uh, articulate the auditor's responsibility with regard to fraud and notes the financial statements. We think these enhancements provide better clarity to investors of what the auditor's role is. It can be done without expanding the scope of an audit, and we support that. The area that we probably have the most concerns about and do not support is the proposed introduction of critical audit matters or CAMs. Let me take a few minutes to explain why. We feel that in the context of an investment company that the, the auditors, the CAM is going to be associated to be a red flag or a sign that could be something is wrong with a fund, when in fact judgments and estimates and assumptions are an inherent part of the financial statement process. With an investment company, we make extensive financial disclosures and need to make, dis and make certain judgments regarding uh, disclosures on investment valuation. We'd expect the auditor to have to call that out as a critical audit matter. But I think it's important to note that, that even though those judgments are made, the auditor is certainly able to obtain enough information to, to give an unqualified opinion. And in these circumstances, calling this out as a red flag, we think, uh, could raise a red flag to investors when no problem exists. Significant disclosures already made, or, and the financial statement opinion is unqualified. Given the view that, that we would not expect to see an audit that, that doesn't have CAM, we think that's going to incent an auditor to identify more CAM to show the comprehensiveness of the work that they've done and their compliance with the PCAOB's directive. Given our concern that, that, could, that these CAMs could be perceived as a red flag, it could have the unintended negative consequences that investors are going to use that as subjective yardstick in determining uh, one fund's value versus another. Let me explain how that could play out for us. So in a large complex like MFS, we employ more than one auditor. We have a two-auditor model. So in this two-auditor two model, and it happens, we've got substantially similar funds audited by different audit firms, each of whom is going to have their own unique thoughts on what constitutes a CAM and how to document that within the auditor's report. So we could have a fund with the same strategy, holdings, investment performance, and disclosures, and still end up with, with having a different description of critical audit matters, and that would have the unintended consequences of putting one fund at a disadvantage over the other one because of subjective language in an auditor's report. When you then take that and take it outside of just one complex and put it across the universe of investment companies, you can see that that expands our concern. We also share the concerns raised for the last couple of days about CAM creating a piecemeal opinion and, and, and putting an auditor in a position to disclose information that management may not be, may not be required to disclose. I, I'm not going to add anything to that today. I did in my written comments. I won't in, in the verbal comments today other than to suggest that uh, if management's in our context, if our financial statements and presentation over something like investments and, and investment valuation is not sufficient, I don't understand how an auditor is going to be able to reach an unqualified opinion on, on our financial statements. The last concern I'll raise about CAM, and it's probably the one that's going to have the most impact on myself and my staff, is additional cost and time it's going to take with auditors' reports. One could argue the level of, of audit evidence and audit work required to reach a, a qualified or unqualified opinion wouldn't change but there will be additional effort to document conclusions of why something is or isn't a CAM and to, docu and to put documentation uh, and non-standard language into the audit report. And when non-standard language is put into the audit report, it's going to require additional review within the audit firm and within the management company, and depending on what it is, it could involve others. 
and the people who are doing that review are not the low-level, least expensive folks. So it's definitely going to add cost to, re to review that language. Um, that is also going to occur when the substantial model of the audit work is complete, so it's going to be towards the end of a very compressed schedule for us. So we do have concerns with that. Uh, another aspect of the proposed standard that concerned us a bit is, is, is the inclusion of audit tenure in the auditor's report. I won't repeat what happened in the la said in the last panel, but our, our concern is just that the auditor's report is, is not impacted by audit tenure. There's also a logistical problem with investment companies. For a company like ours, we have new funds starting and merging and changing every year. And we could, and there are sometimes that there's going to be reports with multiple funds being reported in one book and one set of audit opinions. Each of it has a different start date and therefore a different logistical audit tenure. So we think that that would need to be addressed. We don't have a problem with disclosing audit tenure, but we think there's probably more appropriate places to do it than the auditor's report. The last year of the proposed standard I'd like to comment on is the, is, uh, the clarification of the auditor's responsibility for other information. We absolutely agree it, would, it could be helpful um, to clarify what components of other information we want the auditor to look at and what the expected level of auditor effort is here. We do think some more work needs to be done to actually specify exactly which areas we'd like the auditors to look at uh, and what is the expected level of, of effort there. This is particularly important with an investment company. If you put it in our context, whereas a financial company may have one set of financial statements the annual audits is doing every year, I have a set of funds being audited every month. We have over 35 different filings annually by trust that have multiple financial statements within them. Okay. So there's definitely going to be some costs associated with that. So we want to, um, and there's definitely going to be some logistical issues associated with that. So we want to make sure enough studies done that what we have the auditors look at is something that is something they have the expertise to look at. Um, and it has the appropriate cost benefit. So given that, we, we would encourage additional outreach to be done to determine what are the areas of additional information that are of most value to investors. Of those, which of those that the auditor has the expertise to take a look at, and then have the auditor do some field testing so we can just test that the level of benefit does exceed the level of cost to do that. So in, in concluding, we do, support, uh, we, we do support a number of the initiatives. We certainly support the intent of what the PCAOB is doing. We thank you for having us here today, but as it relates to investment companies, there's a few things we would, we would ask you to consider. First, we'd ask you to reconsider the inclusions of critical audit matters in our reports, um, given that we think it would increase the cost of the audit and also could introduce some other notable negative uh, unintended consequences to our funds. We'd also have ask you to consider using other public documents in the auditor's report if you want to disclose auditor tenure and would ask for that additional outreach to be done on, on other information to clarify what other information you'd like the auditor to take a look at. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Burgess. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to provide my comments related to this important topic of auditor reporting. I commend the PCOB for organizing this roundtable and for its continued outreach. Grant Thornton supports the board's efforts to enhance the relevance and usefulness of the auditor's report. My comments today are focused on the applicability of the proposed new rules to investment companies, and in doing so, I'll also provide some general comments about certain of the key aspects of the proposals primarily CAMs and other information. The application of the PCOB standards should, in most circumstances, be applied uniformly to all issuers. Although we understand the view that investment companies and broker-dealers could be scoped out of the proposal, we struggle with trying to define which issuers should be included versus those that would be exempt. Where do you draw the line? It's difficult to distinguish the circumstances in which an issuer or group of issuers might merit a discussion of CAMs from those that would not merit such disclosure. Second, certain aspects of the proposals would likely need further evaluation, outreach, and deliberation to be applicable to many investment companies, including consideration of the various fund structures and regulatory reporting constructs, such as multi-fund filings. With respect to CAMs, we believe that providing more insight into critical audit matters can give investors and other users of the financial statements information that could be useful in evaluating the underlying financial statements. Grant Thornton's comment letter identifies suggestions for improvement with respect to the proposal scope, filtering mechanisms, and form of communication. Our suggestions are intended to address concerns we have as to how the proposal aligns with current audit processes, 
and documentation protocols. Concentrating on issuer investment companies, we share what seems to be the general view of many other commenters that the primary focus of CAMS will be in the valuation of investment securities. Valuation has been a significant focus of the SEC and investors in recent years, so a CAM related to this complex audit area could be relevant. It's been our experience that audit teams are spending considerable time evaluating the sufficiency of audit evidence related to valuing the more complex level two investments as well as the level three investments. And while we acknowledge that required financial disclosures is set forth in ASC 820, combined with additional management disclosures of portfolio risks and other details around investment portfolios provide investors with a significant amount of information, it's possible that audit commentary for certain matters around a specific investment valuation that might be included in the CAM could be useful. Most of the challenges related to reporting CAMs for investment companies are ones that we believe also apply to the broader population of commercial entities. Uh, we've highlighted three concerns that we've noted and on which we've seen other comment, others comment. Uh, the first two have been discussed at length for the last couple of days, the comparability and the issue of bullet plate language, uh, the disclosure of original information by the auditors. Uh, the third comment relates to the ability of the information to be operational to the investor uh, and not just in a negative way. And, and uh, along the lines of what John said, it's, it's essential for investors to better understand the context for how the auditor determines CAMs and how those matters relate to the underlying financial information. And we share concerns expressed by others that investors may inappropriately look at the auditor's reporting of a CAM or multiple CAMs as a negative indicator as it relates to a fund, resulting in misinformed investment decisions. These aren't easy issues to solve, and we suggest that further discussion and outreach, including perhaps consideration of a phase-in approach, might be a prudent way forward. One final point on CAMs related to investment companies is the expectation included in the proposal that the auditor will rarely not identify a matter as critical. We believe that this expectation may create pressure to identify a matter or multiple matters when there really aren't any. For example, a mutual fund that has a very straightforward and non-complex investment portfolio may not have matters that really meet the definition of a CAM, but the auditor might feel compelled to call certain matters CAMs just in order to, to report something under the proposed standard. So in that regard, we suggest the PCOB reconsider its view that the auditor will rarely not identify a CAM. In response to the proposal related to the auditor's responsibility regarding other information, we agree with the board's view that investors and other users of the financial statements would benefit from understanding the auditor's responsibility for information that accompanies the auditor's report and financial statements. Consistent with our views on CAMs, we also believe that this proposal should apply to investment companies and broker-dealers that are issuers. However, we do not agree with the change in scope of the auditor's responsibility or in the breadth of information subject to the proposed standard. Current standards and practice provides for a read and consider model. The current PCOB proposal increases the requirement to an evaluate and conclude model, which we believe would lengthen the time the auditor would need to spend on such efforts, thereby increasing the costs. We do not perceive that these increased efforts will provide sufficient benefits to investors to justify the changes proposed in the release. Additionally, the annual filing requirements for investment companies differ from those of commercial entities. Further analysis and outreach is important and could result in meaningful application guidance for investment companies to strike the right balance between enhancing the transparency of the auditor's involvement in information outside the financials and the additional cost in providing such information. As the board moves forward with its proposals, we support a post-implementation review separate from the board's inspection process that includes an evaluation of the direct and indirect efforts, effects on financial markets, regulatory scrutiny, and litigation matters. We believe it's inevitable that auditor judgments across and within firms will differ with respect to determining and, and describing CAMs and as a result, there will be diversity in practice. We also believe that users of financial statements would utilize and apply the additional information to be included in the auditor's report in diverse ways to suit their specific needs. 
accordingly monitoring the effects of the new auditor's reporting model and whether it's not only <coughs> whether it is not only being applied appropriately by auditors but also has met user expectations will be essential to achieving the objective of the proposed standards. We're committed to providing meaningful and transparent information that's useful to investors and doing so in a manner that will provide the most benefit while not creating a significant burden to issuers, investors, and the market in general. Thanks again for the opportunity to share our views. Thank you. Jeanette Fremzell? My question deals specifically with brokers and dealers um, and who's using those financial statements, those audited financial statements, customers versus, you know, investors in the broker-dealer itself, and how, how might this be different from the discussions we've been having about investors, you know, in issuers, and, and how should we consider that? Okay. Uh, well, as I noted, uh, approximately 300 firms, uh, 300 broker-dealers are clearing or carrying type firms which hold customer securities and funds. In those instances, um, you know, there is a reporting requirement to, to the customer. But on all the other BDs, uh, majority, uh, there is no customer uh, statement nor order to report that's sent to those individuals. Uh, it's not required. The, the securities and the funds are held by the clearing broker. Uh, now, there, there is a, a SEC website where even the small introducing type firm has to uh, put a, a um, ordered financial statement on that through the SEC website, um, and some, somebody could you know see the uh, usually the confidential report is is not uh, on that, although in some cases it is. But usually it's just a balance sheet with footnotes. I think uh, that's correct with uh, consistent with my understanding as well, although I would just note for uh, a firm such as ours, our broker dealer is wholly owned by the parents, so we have no outside investors at all, and it would really only be uh, customers and uh, regulators that would use the broker dealer financial statements. A question related to the, the funds and and we have suggested in our uh, proposal that, that the uh, uh, application, especially around CAMS, is intended to be scalable. So, so not overkilling it, not underkilling it, but, but making it be the, the right size for the, uh, for the um, entity. And, and I, I've heard uh, the comments that you're making about, gee, is it, is it, are there really any CAMS for most straightforward funds that, uh, that invest in, in um, uh, traded securities or where there aren't the level three valuation issues? And, and and I, uh, I know we've, we've put words in the uh, proposal that suggest that most companies will have, uh, have CAMs. And I, uh, I wonder if we have an opportunity here, because I, I, I don't like the idea of carve-outs. So if we can write something that would be applicable for all types of, uh, of audits, but scalable so that it, it's, uh, it's hitting the right things for the right, right, right companies, do you think it's, it's possible for us to craft language that would accomplish the objectives without making a specific carve-out for, for a fund that would get at the scalability um, uh, aspects that, that it might very well be that in a given fund, there might not be a CAM, and that's okay. Thoughts? I mean, uh, I'll defer to the auditor or how they'll interpret it. My, my fear would be that the auditor is going to want to demonstrate, hey, we've done a good job, and there are critical audit matters. It's hard to suggest that the valuation of investments in an investment company is not a critical audit step, if nothing else. I'd also point out that on, on our funds, which we have minimal level three disclosures, I think our highest concentration of level three disclosures because fund, uh, securities in our funds are less than half of one percent. I still have th generally three pages of disclosure on how I valued investments, and the auditor is, as part of their audit guide, is, is they are looking at one hundred percent of the valuation of my investments. Okay, so. I'd be still fearful that they're going to want to call that out as a critical audit matter, but it's not an issue. If it were an issue, they wouldn't be able to, to give me an unqualified opinion. That's my concern. I think John's concern is fair, but at the same time, I do think that you could 
write the standard in such a way that, uh, that this could be addressed. Uh, I think it's important that the standard be clear that it is contemplated that it wouldn't be rare that a company might have no CAMs. And, you know, in the terms of an investment company that has funds like John described where there are no level three investments, we, we even have some that have mostly level one investments. And, and as I think through those entities, I have a hard time seeing that there would be a critical audit matter relative to investments in a fund that has primarily level one investments. But I do think there is some risk that auditors will feel the need to have at least one CAM, or if I don't, I have it, you know, I, I run the risk of having not met the standard in the eyes of an inspector or somebody else. So I think you just have to be mindful of each side of that coin. I'm also not sure what a CAM could draw out about an example like investment valuation that I'm not already required to disclose. In other words, how many times do you have to say it's hard? <laughs> Yeah, I have a question. I mean, and you know, I'm struck listening to you by the uh, obviously the enormous diversity among broker dealers in this country. You talk about uh, Mr. Pagano clients with capital ranging from twenty thousand dollars to three billion, and I assume Deutsche Bank is much much larger than that. Uh, so these are almost two different kinds of businesses. And uh, the question I have is, if we were to uh, consider the exemptions here, where we simply exempted certain categories from of, of, of businesses from these rules, what would be the line we should draw? Should it be, I mean, they're clearing and introducing brokers. I mean, should, should it be introducing brokers that are excluded? Should there be a capital level below which you, you don't need to comply with these things? What, what would your advice be on that? Well, I, I would say, you know, if you're involved with customer funds, uh, I think that's something that uh, I, I could see having a uh, an interest in, in getting some confidence that those customer funds are in a good place. And uh, so I, I would say that would be my, my biggest driver. Uh, you know, there are some broker dealers that are uh, part of a, a public filing as the holding company is a public entity. Uh, and presumably those are ordered under PCOB standards also, so that that would be important too. I, I think those two things would would be crucial. And I, I just I wanted to add, uh, you, know, you had a, a question before. The uh, primarily with the smaller broker dealers, it's the SEC and Finra that are you know waiting for these. Uh, these audited statements to be filed within 60 days. And now CIPIC this year, there was a recent change this past year where CIPIC gets the full report, uh, including the internal control report. I'm just sort of guessing here, but uh, I would think that uh, in a world where this proposal has come to fruition, uh, a reader of Deutsche Bank's consolidated financials and related audit report would probably not get much different information than a reader of the broker-dealer financial statements separately. So I'm, I'm, uh, I see the appeal of uh, Mr. Pagano's comment that perhaps uh, broker-dealers that are a subsidiary of a company that's otherwise audited and otherwise reporting under PCAOB standards uh, might possibly be exempted. Uh, I think you might think about a, uh, an exemption also for uh, audits of uh, smaller broker dealers that are very closely held. I don't think that uh, people look to the financial statements for uh, safety and soundness. I think they look to the regulators for that. So I'm not sure there's much to be gained by that. They're not investing in the broker dealer per se. Do you have any experience, uh, for example, in your customers who are customers of your broker dealer, whether when they look at uh, Deutsche Bank's financial statements, do they only focus on the, the consolidated financial statements of the bank itself, or do they actually are they are they interested interested about the entity with whom actually which they're dealing, or do you know? I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I do know that we are required to send customers of the broker dealer broker dealer financial statements, and we're not required to send them uh, consolidated financial statements, uh, but they are certainly available. But we have not made a study of that nature.
Uh, Mr. Furman, uh, you heard Mr. Corcoran uh, tick off a number of items in the, uh, in, in the, in the proposed standard that he supported. Uh, are there anything, is there anything in the proposed standard that you support? I think a great deal of what's in this standard, frankly, is already being done. It's just reported to the audit committee rather than to uh, the public at large. And in as much as the audit committee is uh, meant to be an independent body and is in fact an independent body, uh, I, I think that they are there also to protect the uh, users of the financial statements. So you have the company making an honest effort to uh, provide good disclosure in accordance with uh, the requirements in a way that's understandable. You have the auditors checking that. You have the audit committee checking the auditors. Um, uh, so to answer your question, no. Uh, the, uh, the thing I fear is this. The financial statements in and of themselves are already a summary. Uh, you know, we have millions and millions of transactions and we could give anybody more information. And I jokingly said to people in the green room, we could print a copy of our trial balance and, and mail that out, and I would say that would detract rather than add to the information content of our annual report. So, uh, just you know, just because the information is available and, and low cost, as was discussed in the previous panel, uh, does not make it useful information. And, and so, I have to say, uh, quite honestly, sir, that uh, no, that I, I do not support this proposal. I'd like to add just to the. Uh, uh, the order's responsibilities on other information. Uh, the oath or affirmation that's attached to the report uh, was noted in the proposal would be subject to this. And uh, actually, I, I do see benefit that in that uh, the order to get some some comfort on that. Well, uh, here's the problem: we had a financial crisis. Um, <clears throat> and I take it some of the entities that fell flat were substantial banks and broker dealers. And um, we had an investment company that broke the buck uh, as a result of a concentration in the securities of a broker dealer. Holding itself out as a money market fund, it broke the buck. Um, and this attracted a lot of attention. Um, and it resulted in us being charged with uh, creating standards, audit standards for broker dealers. The SEC reminded broker dealers that they had to have audited financial statements, and that included some schedules and some, some fairly specific uh, information. <coughs> and I share here with Jay Hansen's concern over the carve-outs. I, I think uh, there's a well-trod, well-understood path for regulators creating um, guidance. Uh, and perhaps if you have funds for which the auditor has satisfied themselves, there really is nothing in that fund portfolio but cash, money, government, government high, uh, high quality government securities. Maybe there are times in which uh, the guidance could indicate that uh, critical audit matters uh, may in fact not uh, not be so rare in a particular area or segment if we looked at it. But right now we're sitting here having looked at some broker dealers and having reluctantly determined that many of them, um, some of whom are carrying, uh, don't have audits that are independent. Um, we have a lot of errors that we see in the preparation of financial, the, the preparation of books and records by the auditors, the material that's in our public report. So how do we, how do we simply say, well, notwithstanding the financial collapse, notwithstanding the, um, uh, the instructions of Don Frank, notwithstanding the statute under which we operate, which says we have to uh, foster the interest of the public in, uh, in financial, good financial reporting. And, and not saying the fact that we know that the SEC also wants to know for the, the, uh, for the audits that it alone, that it has a primary interest in or that FINRA has a primary interest in, they want to know that the audit has been well performed. Um, how do we do our duty by a wholesale exemption? Um, 
of an entire industry which, as John points out, now has trillions trillions of American savings in it. Um, if, if we went forward, I guess, I guess Mr. Fairman's position has the beauty of saying you don't think we should do any of it for anybody. <laughs> but, but don't we have a problem with the general carve-out, and isn't it clear that we've got to get to some kind of a mechanism for, create, for, for scaling the wind to the shore and lamb and treating how uh, these different companies' business models uh, suggest themselves to an auditor? Don't we have to do something here to fine-tune? I, I fully agree that uh, things need to uh, be done and things have been done, I think. Uh, we have uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, of course, which I think actually predated the crisis. But we have the Volcker Rule, we have Dodd-Frank, we have increasing levels of capital requirements, we have substantial increase in regulatory oversight, all good necessary things uh, that I think uh, uh, are our past due. Uh, and we're working hard every day to comply with all those things as well. I just question whether, uh, whether it's specific to broker-dealers or much more broadly, whether this uh, helps that situation. If the auditor is doing a good job, he's doing a good job. I, I question whether the reader of the critical audit matters, the reader of the uh, report on other information uh, will find that useful. Uh, I think that they would rather know that there's a team of regulators, a team of auditors from the regulator that live in our building that are there every single day and are working very hard to make sure, as we are, that the uh, institution is safe and sound and will be here, I hope, for another hundred years or more. I don't think this is the right way. Well, the comment from the United Kingdom yesterday and today was that they have managed there. Uh, they've managed an expanded audit report, and uh, they've done that without having undue delay in the delivery of the report, in the reporting schedule, and without uh, uh, some kind of a hockey stick increase in costs. So does your British, exp you all have, uh, have resources there. Does your UK experience suggest that perhaps this can be done? I'm not familiar with what's going on in the UK, quite honestly. Um, I have read the uh, IAS, IAASB uh, proposal, which I think is uh, very similar to this. I think we would have a, a similar reaction there. Um, you know, I, uh, again, I just have to say that I think that uh, uh, the regulators are uh, doing a very diligent job, and uh, I think that uh, that's the appropriate place to uh, address many of the concerns you're listening. I'm by no means an expert on what changes have happened in the UK, but my understanding is they are not, the, the subset that they're applying to now does not include an OIC, an open end investment company, which would equate to, in, to, our, to our investment company. I do think you need to consider, for lack of a better term, the simple nature of the operations of an investment company. Every investment company really has, they may have different objectives in terms of what type of investments they're going to go into and whatnot, but all of them are just, in turn, investing money in a portfolio that is 100% disclosed, 100% validated by the auditor, and pages of the disclosure on how those valuations take place. John, it's a fair point up to a point. To the extent you're talking about two auditor funds, I think this is something that is of great interest. But when you're saying that you're concerned with critical audit matters is that there's an assumption of something being wrong and that a tendency to uh, do quotas, so many of your objections to the proposal would go to the kind of issuers who have been subject to it in the UK. So I, I think you, you have in some ways narrowed um, the concern when you say investment companies are, are a unique animal. It, it's a narrower sub subset of concerns you have when you're focusing on the peculiarities of the investment fund, of, of the investment company industry, it would seem to me. Well, what, what I'm trying to suggest is the subjective nature of an auditor to be able to call out that two different auditors may decide something different is a critical audit matter. And in a simplified structure like an investment company, that's going to have a much different impact than if I'm talking about a multinational corporation where you would expect that sorts of things to be different. And, and I, do, I do see that as, an, as a, a concern lodged just with, with how, as to how the proposal might affect investment companies. But I'm saying that on the broader attack which you make on the proposal, or the broader expression of disagreement with it, you are, you are going to many of the issues which the UK seems to have successfully confronted and, and, and dealt with.
I, I think we can probably agree to disagree as it relates to an investment company context, which is all I'm speaking about. Well, uh, this has been helpful and informative, and we thank you. And uh, this concludes the, uh, the first roundtable on the audit reporting model, and we, in some ways we did save the best uh, to last. You all did a great job. Thank you.